Thank you very much for your patience with me. It was very delightful to see the previous uh, panel there. Um, and we work uh, we work very heavily with uh, SEMCOG there in Southeast Michigan, and so Rachel has truly been a leader over there. Muhammad is actually my academic nephew. <laughs> we just learned that yesterday. So his PhD advisor got his PhD from the same person that I got my PhD from. And yes, that's a thing for us nerds to talk about. Um, I guess now the Oracle chap, who I've not yet met, I shall reassure you that we use quite a bit of different Oracle software up and down our system. So that I felt like in a good company. And then I have played soccer in Schomburg. So <laughs> there we go. So a little bit about our system, just so that you think I'm cool. Um, this is kind of cool how we're over here. I feel like I'm Borat. <laughs> Getting away with something. Here we go. Now the person that sits here, this next panel, screwed. So we provide about 40%, a little over 40% of the water for the state of Michigan, including Flint. It is phenomenal. I get that question all the time, and I've also been told by my boss and others, stop mentioning Flint. It's like, <laughs> Whenever we go anywhere, and I mention we provide the water here, do you know anything about Flint? Yes. Yes, I do. We provide the water for Flint in the northern part of our system. We have a water treatment plant, the Lake Huron water treatment plant, that provides the water for Flint and then a good chunk of northern Detroit. We have four other treatment plants, so we're five of the uh, 14 treatment plants that, uh, that Rachel mentioned that are providing water. Interesting, her question, the answer, or her, the question about, well, are you concerned about water resources here? We br we're bringing it directly from the Great Lakes, and unlike here, Chicago, we do not have a diversion, meaning we take the water out from the Great Lakes and we put it right back into the Great Lakes. So we do not have to worry about the, uh, uh, the um, treaty with Canada to not divert water. Here they do, that's why otherwise, hey, you just take it out and run the pipes and it's expensive, but you got all the water you want. The concern is, of course, draining Lake Michigan and the rest of the lakes, which actually is a thing, potentially, because if you look at Lake Ariel over in Central Europe, you've seen that they had a lake the size of Lake Michigan and it is now not there, or it's much, much, much smaller. So it is a thing. We take it out, put it right back in. So we have water. <laughs> On the wastewater side, we're a little smaller than MWRD here in Chicago. However, we only have one treatment plant, so our treatment plant is actually bigger than their biggest treatment plant, which I also find great joy of pointing that out to them <laughs> all the time. One of the things, I certainly about the data and the data sharing aspects of what everyone's talked about here is that um, we're collaborating. If you look, you just Google my name, John Norton PFOS. There's been several papers that we published with other utilities, John Norton Paralysis or John Norton Biosolids, and you'll see the John Norton paper. I'm like fourth or fifth in the list of papers. We published several papers here with folks at MWRD and other utilities around the countries on these sorts, a country around, about these sorts of things. And that is a tremendous, huge benefit. The collaboration between utilities, uh, this is not my typical energy level, but typically I'm more like the color of my shirt or my shoes energy level. Um, we work, I reach out, we, re we gain, they reach out to us. So we're working with Denver, uh, and uh, San Antonio, uh, Houston, New York uh, DEP, and to, to talk about the different issues and the different uh, challenges facing us and how we work to draw, address those issues. So there we go. The water side, it's about 340 million a year revenue and about that same amount in capital reinvestment. On the sewer side, it's about four, uh, four and a half million dollars uh, uh, operations and again, about that much for capital reinvestment. The rain event that, um, that um, Rachel just mentioned was uh, June 26 of last year. And it was enough, uh, it was uh, seven inches of rain in 13 hours. And when she mentioned the highways 
being full, you guys may not have caught the whole picture of this. The, the highways in Detroit are, are below ground, a num number of them are, and so there was enough water there that it was floating semis down the road. It's like, holy shit, this is a huge impact. So for that, that one day, through all of our system, we were pumping 17 billion gallons of watery sewage. <laughs> awesome. And then there were some pictures there on the other side showing you that I really was not lying about anything much. Now the research side, this is where, honest to gosh, I can't believe I get to do this. This is a lot of fun for me, quite frankly, so I'm very grateful for the job. Um, so I'm the director of energy, research, and innovation. So the energy team reports up to me, the research side reports up to me, and then there's some innovative things that we're trying to do. I'm gonna focus on the research side, because <laughs> We use a million dollars worth of electricity every week. And I have half a million dollars worth of natural gas every week. It's like, well, we could go to energy neutral and turn everything off. Well, but we're constantly having to address things like PFAS and microplastics and emerging contaminants and such, so we don't. We can also spend a huge amount of money. Okay, again, a million dollars worth of electricity every week. We could spend a lot of money building the solar panels and wind so that we could continue to treat water <laughs> during the day and when it's windy. Those of you who've ever had to get up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, sorry, <laughs> hold it till when it's sunny again. We're moving to get there, but it's a real thing and it's important to have those cross communication conversations on how to get there. So we treat water, and this is my, my map that I share with our internal team and others. And so let me just use a pointer here just because that way you get even more bored and feel like you'll fall asleep after these fine food. Intake, source water monitoring, the algal blooms, we have several projects looking at that sort of neat stuff. The water treatment itself, how to enhance it, how to optimize it, how to deal with a big storm event, how to deal with an algal bloom, what do you do? How do you pipe it out with this is so cool. We have pipes in the ground that were installed in 1856. That's older than most of you in this room. <laughs> and occasionally they fail. Now the neat thing about our failures, the neat thing, I'm glad this isn't being recorded, right, Kent? This is not, okay, good, we're good here. They're spectacular. We're the wholesaler, so all of our pipes are, seven, are four feet in diameter or bigger. We had one fail at 5.15 last October 31st, trick or treat day. The water blasted out. Let's say if it was leaving the ground here, it would have gone up over almost a house, smashing into a house, blew in the side of the, of the wall, filled the house about this, about as tall as I am, bulged out the garage door, which just about failed, and at that time the front door failed, blew off the hinges, blew out in the yard, and you can see this spectacular pathway of destruction and mess. Unfortunately, we didn't time that failure properly. That was humor. <laughs> okay, we don't time our failures, <laughs> but we, because we were still recovering from that big rain event on the wastewater side or the water, wastewater collection side and such, which had energy challenges, uh, pump condition challenges, MDOT has huge pumps, bigger than ours even, to pump out the highways and such. Well, boom, this thing happened. So you have these massive failures and how do you deal with stuff there? So there's a lot of worry, work that we're doing with the reinforcing and relining of those things. How do you reline something? It's kind of cool. I'm, I'm wearing, I don't know if you noticed, I'm wearing orange. Um, it, it blends in sometimes in blue. Because, <laughs> um, you know, that's uh, Illinois colors. My wife in the back here in the nice colorful maize and blue dress, she teaches, uh, she's a professor of material science engineering down at University of Illinois Champaign. We're collaborating together on hydrogen embrittlement of reinforcing wires to see if we can figure out how they break so they don't. It's a so cool, and that's romantic right there, tell you. <laughs> Okay. Gets on down, we do source water, water treatment, water distribution, the water quality. The people in Flint didn't die from lead poisoning, they died from Legionella. So what can we do to lower the Legionella uh, potential in the water? Uh, oh my goodness, so, so much uh, collection system, optimum, you know, there's so many neat things that we're doing with our research stuff, it's just really cool. Well one of the things is, how can we collaborate with others to 
do a little bit of figuring out so that we can go forward. Now, interest, earlier this week, actually, it was a thing, as you know, John, you gotta make sure that you sell you what you're doing because if we have a budget issue, Detroit, the reason GLWA exists is we were split off from the Detroit water and sewer system when Detroit went bankrupt. Everybody drinks, everybody flushes. You can't just stop running that system. They turned off the lights. Our, our, our traffic lights were literally off. That's how bad it got. But people were still drinking and flushing. So he's formed us as an independent entity. So I'm looking for free stuff all the time. But I gotta benefit the people that are doing that. It's just, I don't want their, their, their philanthropy. I want, I want to have a team relationship here. So earlier this week, they were saying, well, John, you better make sure that you, you publicize and share what you're doing. Because you know research, that's like the icing at the top of the cake. Like, no, it's not. We're the insurance. We're spending, a couple years ago, we were spending a billion dollars a year on capital reinvestment. You wanna go spend a billion dollars a year without figuring out if it's gonna work or not? You go right ahead. But if you need your smart team of folks to kinda of dig in there and figure out and to talk to MWRD in the city of Cincinnati and others that have these challenges to make sure it'll work, there you go. But the fact is we are, we are collaborating with a number of folks. Most of the universities here, there's Michigan, uh, Tickle, which is uh, um, University of Tennessee, uh, Wayne State, which is a decent uh, regional school that are in downtown Detroit. There's that uh, Lansing trade school. Is the, there, I saw someone wearing a Michigan State jacket. Are they still here? Okay, because we're actually funding quite a bit of research with them. So that makes sense. We're paying them to do research. They work with us, yay. Where we also are collaborating with a number of other entities, and here are the projects that I'm talking about today with HDR, which is a, an engineering firm, um, Arcadis, another uh, uh, very, also a very good engineering firm, and then Xylem, actually, and then Brown and Caldwell, another, I guess they would want to call themselves like a service, how did you guys all do? A service provider for solution management or whatever the term is, the engineering firms of awesomeness. And then um, Xylem and Structural in, uh, Technologies are both uh, prov uh, pro vendors of uh, providers of other, the word solutions, which I'm sorry, I couldn't think of another word. We've worked with them on research projects. Now, why would they want to work with a utility on a research project? One of the aspects is, and this is something I, I'm always working with with the, uh, the academic institutions is, look, when we come up with an engineering design, you make this, you make it a thousand times. You don't modify this for, oh, you're gonna be in Chicago? Well, it needs to be a little bigger. Or you're gonna be in this, you're gonna be in central Ohio near that regional trade school? You better have bigger buttons because they're too clumsy to hit it right. <laughs> you saw where I'm going with this, okay? We don't do that. But all of the infrastructure, the civil infrastructure that we have, is customized for the local region. They have different drivers, different constraints, different soil conditions, different ambient temperatures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When Flint failed to treat their water properly, when they tried to treat their own water properly, they were treating a river which was fairly filthy, but people do treat rivers which are fairly filthy because that's what they got, and they got great water. They didn't adequately design and operate the system for the local conditions. Why in the world would a vendor want to experiment with local conditions with us? Hey, I just answered the own question. They get to have an engaged utility, third party validation, you know, hey, Dr. John, did they really do this? Yes, they did, we had this here, this is how it worked, and little challenges over here, yay. They get that feedback and they get to be able to demonstrate that to others. Here's how it works, here's, here's what's going on. It's a fairly moderate investment for them and it's a tremendous value to us because we also get to explore that technology. Plus there's the team building aspects. So the collaborative public private partnership there, pretty darn cool. Not what you guys are thinking yet about the big public private partnership such as the folks at the Illinois, I'm sorry, the Indiana Tollway uh, described others. However, that's kind of where we're gonna go with us. Oh, bad word. Since you guys are tired and it's late, I wanted pictures. I, apparently I screwed up. So imagine a picture of a big pipeline in the ground. 
with the, the Kerchival Street pipeline renewal. It's kind of cool. They went underground, opened it up, uh, used robots. So if you guys have seen The Avengers, it's a documentary about space aliens. When Tony Stark lands and there, this thing is circular and it takes off of his suit as he's walking down there, this device looks exactly like that. It goes inside the pipe and layers on the materials inside the pipe. It's so cool. I, I'm sorry, I still I feel like a little kid that I get to do these things. The Ubano Acoustic Sensor Network is a really fancy sensor network developed by the University of Michigan, which is the best university on the planet. I, I did go there, I mentioned that, I think. But, we're, but and what it does is it detects really low key sound or acoustics from our pipes that gives us information over when and how they're going to fail. You, fail. And even better, this is so amazing to me, this math is just beyond me. They put on sensors, then you whap the pipe, literally, with a wrench, boom, and, and the way in which the sound wave travels up and down the pipe gives you an idea, a good idea, on the structural rigidity of the pipe, and thus you know where weak parts are. If you've ever had some uh, uh, chinaware or something, you hit the china, you know, ding, 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 and then you hit it with a thud. Well, that's exactly it. It sounds differently because there's a little crack going through it. You know, that's when a bad piece exists. Well, this is just amazing. Now, how are they doing all this stuff? Artificial intelligence, the same way when you dictate into your phone or, or you yell at, hey Siri, or hey, uh, I, whatever the humor is, you've seen the, the, the little skit about them yelling at their phone about Alexa or trying to do something or other, same idea. And so it reads the different sorts of things, gives us information back, and that's a different approach than another group that's doing it, but yay. Um, now on the fuel side and such, uh, we treat, uh, our, our water treatment plant, wastewater treatment plant is a 1.8 billion gallon per day facility. We produce about 700 tons of biosolids every day that would fill this room to higher than it is. And we are researching methods right now to turn that, squeeze it into bio crude that we can then sell at reasonably decent profit that will essentially potentially run our entire system. Now there's where the public-private partnership comes in. We treat water, we treat waste, so, oh, I got another hour? Ken, is what you're, yes. okay. Yeah, the public-private partnership comes in there is that we do not do these other things. We treat water, we treat wastewater. We do a really good job of that. If you've got a high-end fancy dancy thing like hydrothermal liquefaction that uses hundreds of degrees of temperature and 3,000 PSI uh, pressure to squeeze waste into bio crude, yay, save the future, we're not gonna run that. So we're doing a lot of research in that, but we're also trying to bring in other partners that will eventually be the people to, that will run that. Then finally, we have a neat project, a neat collaboration with Brown and Caldwell and Michigan State and several others looking at uh, biosolids and micropollutants because we keep on investing in science and those bloody word chemists keep on becoming better. So the, the phrase that I've heard is zero keeps getting smaller. We have parts per trillion PFAS in our biosolids, and in, if you've read, the, if you get Consumer Reports, Consumer Reports just just said that they want, they believe that it should be a one part per trillion limit. Oh my heavens! So what we're doing is we're trying to figure out when and how it goes. How does it pat, leach and travel through the environment? How does it get taken up into the food that you ate earlier today, and will it kill you? And if so, when? Not that that should make you worried or anything. So sorry we don't have pictures. There we go. Next level research goal, and this is the part where I'm going with, is that we are decommissioning, because we are oversized, we're decommissioning our northeast, our northeast water treatment plant. It's a 240 MGD water treatment facility, and we're going to be converting that into just simply a pump station plus an R&D center, a research and development testing and trialing center. Now where I have as examples is underwriter laboratories. I don't know if this is an underwriter laboratory listing. Every piece of electric device you have in your house is a UL listing. 
National Sanitation Foundation, now known as NSF International, actually in Ann Arbor tests and trials and validates technologies for water use. And then Consumer Report Labs, they buy vacuum cleaners, coffee makers, whatever, test them and trial them, and they give that information back out to the public. Testing and trialing vacuum cleaners and, and coffee makers is fine uh, and, and easy-ish. Testing and trialing uh, multi-million dollar mixing systems and such and all is a little bit more challenging. That's where we're going. We're starting to get folks in there. Why would a third party entity wanna pay us money to do this or give us stuff to do this? Third party validation, third party trialing. If we go to the west about 50 miles, we're gonna see an, a, uh, at the Rock River, I believe it's the Rock River Sanitary District where Aqua Aerobics built, Aqua Aerobics is an equipment manufacturer, built a facility to test and trial their stuff within that sanitary district so they can see what happens. What does real world look like when we have this stuff through? That's what's going on. We want to be a partner for the others to go develop and grow technologies. We want them to be successful so that, <laughs> that we can buy their stuff. And there we go. It's awesome. I think I have maybe one more slide. Oh, some challenges, resistance and challenges. I don't know if this is necessarily the room that really needs to hear all that. It's in the slides, fine to talk about it. You know, what workforce limitations, just if anyone else, as I mentioned, that is our keyest goal. And then here we go. I actually will include this just a little bit. When you learn your own system very, very well, you, you start out with nothing. My wife and I don't play golf. We're down here if we we're in the golfing world. If any of you have ever played golf, we go play a round of golf, you guys would be able to give us advice so that we don't look as much like idiots. As we were to improve, if you had a year's worth of experience or such, as you rise, the world in which we'll give you guidance and advice decreases. Who coaches Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods to be better in their respective field? There's not many left. Well, the same sort of thing, right at the top, when you're mastery of a system, those are the same sorts of clever, sharp, persistent, resilient, hardworking people that have developed whatever it is, and then they're entering into another field. Well, how do they succeed? How do they go around it? And that's a really interesting challenge. And I've actually decided I'm putting this in all of my talks from now on out because I see that this, this how do you collaborate when you don't have any idea what the other person really needs and wants? And so some of your questions are like, well, of course we don't like this. And then other ones of your questions are like, I don't even know what you mean by that question. And you're friends. You know each other. You want to help each other. And yet sometimes that layer of I don't even know what you're talking about is a real thing. We're, we've been working now for two and a half years with the local public health officials regarding a COVID project. I realized within the first couple calls with the local public health officials in Southeast Michigan that they had a whole paradigm of how things worked and the wastewater group and then the academic groups had their own paradigms and we weren't going to succeed as a team unless we were brought together. And so I just like, okay, once again, I'm the Disney sidekick, <laughs> entertaining and I keep the plot moving, trying to pull people back together so we can to continue to communicate. Now we're working with CDC and others to try to help others do this sort of thing. But when you're as good as you possibly can and you're reaching over into a new environment, you have to, you have to humble yourself because you're the apex of your discipline, which is over here. And when you talk to someone else, they're the schlub of the new discipline. They're not as bright or capable or as talented as you, or maybe they are, but likely not. You are the top. And so you have to really roll back your energy, your enthusiasm, and your, I don't know, it's your, your arrogance, let, the, let, your, let your ego go. And you're talking with a guy, he knows his stuff. He's not the top, but he's going to give you the feedback for a new area. That's been something for me which has been challenging because I'm naturally very enthusiastic and I know this stuff. I'm like, so do you mean this? Do you mean, oh, and I'm pretty soon I've, I've driven them to be quiet and they're no longer giving me the information that we need in order to succeed. Setting the table for next steps. Most recent success, we just had a project with Wayne State in order to run our pilot facility there. In, in our Waterworks Park lab. This is the team here. This is actually a pilot facility. It's about the size of this room, and it is a one to 17,000 scale model of the full scale plant. 
And so we're, we're moving there, starting to wake up people's minds and what can happen. This is uh, Alexander Graham Bell. He invented the radio dish. Okay. I also had a picture of Michael Jordan in there, and I would say, like, you know, this is Steve Curry and whatever. When he tried, how do you do this? When he tried his first time around, he failed. It was the filament light bulb thing. He tried again, failed again. He failed for two and a half years, 6,000 6, trials. At what time do you tell your boss, you know, I've been doing this for a couple of weeks now, not worked. And it's for several months now, it's not worked. At what point did you say, you know what, you know, give up. This is not the way to go about it. He stuck at it two and a half years. There we go. He didn't invent the light bulb, but he improved it. Any questions? <laughs> no, say I do have questions there. <laughs> questions. Delighted to talk, and I'm looking over at Ken thinking, John, shut up. <laughs> <laughs>